The Russian Civil War began in the aftermath of the Great October Revolution of 1917. While the revolution itself was almost bloodless, the civil war that followed was one of the most tragic periods in Russian history. Violence and cruelty became commonplace in the four years that followed, and hopes for democracy were crushed. Russia was ruled by a small group of revolutionaries known as the Bolsheviks, who understood only too well what they must do to hold the power they had seized. Those who opposed the Bolsheviks understood that these new leaders would irrevocably change Russia. The struggle between the Bolsheviks and their enemies shaped the new Soviet state and its later development. Millions were killed and crippled, while hundreds of thousands, the bloom of the nation, left the country never to return. The causes of the Russian Civil War were deeply rooted in Russian history. The First World War had caused desperate suffering among the Russian people, but other more long-standing problems were just as important. For centuries, Russian peasants had been tied to land they did not own and forced to work for others. In 1861, only two civilized nations, the United States and Russia, permitted one man to own another and force him to work against his will. But in that year, as the United States began its own civil war to decide the question of slavery, Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom in the Russian Empire. Yet vestiges of the old system continued to plague the vast majority of the Russian population, whose prospects for land and education remained severely limited. For Nicholas II, who became Tsar in 1894, the desires of many of his subjects for radical changes in government were difficult to accept. His indecisiveness plagued Russia and contributed to the country's internal problems. Russia entered World War I in 1914. By 1916, devastating military defeats and internal problems aggravated by the war caused most Russians to believe that revolution was the only solution. In 1917, Russia experienced not one, but two revolutions. The first revolution took place in February. Born of frustration and disappointment, this revolution of cues demonstrated the lack of confidence of urban workers in their government's effectiveness. On March the 2nd, 1917, Nicholas II abdicated and soon after, he and his family were arrested. Soldiers and workers in Petrograd banded together to form a quasi-governmental organization called the Petrograd Soviet. Its leaders represented two political parties, the Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. Under the Tsar, the Duma had been Russia's parliamentary body. Now the Duma's Provisional Committee nominated ministers for its first cabinet. Prince Lvov as cabinet head and Pavel Milyukov as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Revolutionary parties did not play a significant role in the February Revolution, but the Bolsheviks acted immediately to take advantage of the new freedom released by the revolution and amassed the forces necessary to launch an offensive. In April, the German government granted permission for Vladimir Ulyanov, a Russian exiled in Switzerland, to return to his homeland through German territory in a sealed train. This man would play the key role in Russia's revolutionary history. He was known as Ilyin, Tulin, Petrov, and Frey, but his most famous alias was Lenin. As the months passed, the provisional government lost popular support. Bolshevik propaganda hastened the erosion of police and military authority, and the government was unable to halt the disintegration of social order. Russia's people, convinced of the futility of the war, responded to anti-war propaganda. Combat action continued, but in the spring of 1917, fraternization between Russian and German soldiers began. Millions of peasants in uniform saw their fight as counterproductive. 
By summer, military command had collapsed and mass defection from the front lines began. These soldiers who voted with their feet were the largest group of combat-ready men Russia had ever absorbed from a war. In early June, the delegates to the first all-Russian Congress of Soviets in Petrograd heard Lenin state the Bolsheviks' intention to seize power. In July, the news of a military order issued under pressure from the Allies to launch a frontal offensive touched off a series of mass demonstrations. When the demonstrations became menacing, the government moved loyal troops into the city who brutally put down the unrest. The suppression of the demonstrations and the failure of the offensive brought down the head of the government, Prince Lvov, who was replaced by Alexander Kerensky. At the time, Kerensky, a socialist and a prominent lawyer, was a popular figure who, less than a year later, in flight from the Bolsheviks, would leave his country with a Serbian passport on the deck of a British cruiser, never to return. The commander-in-chief of the Russian army, Larv Kanilov, who participated in the conference, believed that only stronger measures would save his country. Late in August, he brought his wild division to Petrograd and attempted to establish a military dictatorship. His attempt failed. The division was disarmed and he was arrested. More and more people listened to Bolshevik calls for support. In Petrograd and other cities, Lenin and the Bolsheviks waged a determined propaganda campaign. The Bolsheviks set up a military revolutionary committee to plan and implement their seizure of power. Their military forces were loosely organized groups called Red Guards. The time had come. The capital of the Russian Empire was the city of St. Petersburg. During World War I, the city's name had been changed to Petrograd. After Nicholas II abdicated, the Winter Palace became the seat of the provisional government. During the week before the revolution, rumors of an attack circulated. The approaches to the Winter Palace were not guarded. Log barricades were hastily constructed, but provided almost no protection and the government troops assigned to protect the palace were young recruits and a battalion of women. The Bolsheviks, who had already captured the Smolny Institute, had more personnel and greater determination and confidence in their cause. The Bolshevik attack on the Winter Palace on October the 25th was not filmed, but in the week afterward, the damage from the attack was recorded. On October the 30th, the first military engagement of the Russian Civil War took place. The Bolsheviks' Red Guards faced Cossacks loyal to the recently overthrown government outside Petrograd. The Cossack general, Pyotr Krasnov, was arrested, but released almost immediately. Within a week, Soviet power was established almost bloodlessly throughout most of the former Russian Empire. But opposition remained, most importantly, in Moscow. Military cadets loyal to the provisional government seized the Kremlin, the State Duma, and other buildings in the city's center. The cadets made the Alexander and Alexis cadet schools their bases of operation. Red Guard units defeated their opponents, but lost a thousand troops in fighting that severely damaged Moscow's center. After General Kanilov's abortive attempt to assume power in Petrograd, he and other members of his staff were imprisoned in the town of Bukov. Because they believed they could justify their actions, none had attempted to escape. When Moscow fell, their lives were in danger. 
They were freed by the commander-in-chief of the Russian army and made their way south to the Don. The generals hoped to make common cause with Cossack Ataman Alexei Kaledin, who had seized power in the Don region and refused to recognize the Bolshevik government. Many of those loyal to the former government went south to the Don. There, the White Volunteer Army was formed from the remaining forces of the Russian army. The 4,000 men were united in their hatred of the Bolsheviks. General Mikhail Alexeyev became the first supreme commander of the Volunteer Army. He had been commander-in-chief of the Russian forces, but was now dying of cancer. When General Karnilov arrived in the south, he assumed military command leaving civil and diplomatic matters to Alexeyev. The volunteer army badly needed arms and ammunition. Russia's military industry was concentrated in the country's center, now almost completely controlled by the Bolsheviks. So the whites turned for help to Russia's former allies who were still at war with Germany. The French, British and Americans to whom the whites appealed could not decide what groups to support and what aid to send. In December 1917, Bolshevik troops headed south to the Don, collecting scattered red units on the way. The march marked the beginning of the Echelon War, a period that lasted until mid-1918, when no front lines existed and fighting along the railroads went on with uprisings in urban areas. Red military forces were small and highly mobile. Cossacks had traditionally been considered the most loyal supporters of the empire. Grand Prince Alexei, the son of Nicholas II, had held the title of Ataman of the Cossacks since he was four years old. The highly trained and well-equipped Cossacks had formed the emperor's crack guards. The Don Cossacks were formidable opponents of the Bolsheviks. But many Cossacks were disillusioned by World War I, while non-Cossacks of the Don were leaning towards the Bolsheviks. Many people who lived in the Don opposed Kaledin's union with the commanders of the volunteer army and the politicians who had fled to the Don from Petrograd. These men, who wanted to revive Russia as an indivisible state, were unwelcome by the people of the Don, who wanted to create an independent state. On January the 10th, 1918, the Congress of Frontline Cossacks stripped Kaledin of his powers as Ataman, and Kaledin shot himself. General Kanilov decided to leave the Don and lead the volunteer army to the Kuban. Avoiding the more numerous Reds, Kanilov's forces joined the troops of the white Kuban government and reached Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban. The volunteer army's trek across the snow-covered Kuban steppe became known as the Ice March. On April the 8th, Kanilov attempted to take the Kuban capital. The assault was beaten back and only 1,500 men were left in the volunteer army. Kornilov decided to attack again, but in the early morning hours of April the 13th, a shell hit the headquarters of the volunteer army, killing Kornilov himself. <laughs> 